Hi guys. Right. Mm. This is, this might not be a popular video. It might not be. It'll be popular with some, but it won't be popular with others. Especially the Sony fanboys. Oh dear God. So, everybody had the um, A7R Mark IV dropped on them yesterday with um, a stupidly, stupidly huge number of photo sites crammed on the centre. What is it? 60 odd megapixels? Absolutely pathetic. Nuts. That's going to be diffraction limited up the yin yang. And um, I can't remember. We'll, we'll have a look at what the photo site size is a little bit later on. But Sony are bragging yeah, that it's got 15 stops of dynamic range. Bullcrap. No, it hasn't. It hasn't got 15 stops of dynamic range at all. It's got 15 stops, perhaps, of lab test. Uh, dynamic range and if you go on the specifications for it on the Sony website you will see where it says dynamic range it says go and see note is it note number four or note number 14 and it does say Sony lab test conditions so what I want to do is I just want to discuss the difference between real you real world usable dynamic range and lab test dynamic range obviously I haven't got, Sony would never give me a, a 7R Mark IV. Sony would never give me anything for testing because they know what had happened. But this here is a Sony RAW file, a RW, and uh, this shot belongs to uh, Phil Allard. Yes, it does. Hi, Phil. You all right, mate? And, um, yes. Mm. We are going to go off at a little bit of a tangent, but I really do want you to stick with this so you'll understand where I'm coming from. If we look at this shot, I um, can't remember where it is, somewhere down in Cornwall somewhere, rather spectacular looking coastline, you know, this is shot in an A7R Mark III, which is supposedly got 13.5 to 13.7 stops. Um, I think Sony tell you it's 14.5 and DxO Mark tell you it's 14.7. So I'm just going to give you a quick rough and ready demonstration of what lab test dynamic range encompasses first of all the brightest area in this scene is going to be the sun now i'm going to just make sure i'm active in lightroom and what i want you to do is on the histogram here when i hover over anywhere you will see rgb values right now they are they look a little bit weird because they are not RGB values that you might be used to in the likes of Photoshop. These are not RGB values, they are RGB percentages, percentages per channel. And if I come up and hover around inside this brightest area of the scene, and you will see that it's sort of 99.6, 99.7, we struggle to get above 99.7. And that's in the red channel. In the blue channel, it's 99.8. Now then, what on earth do these values mean? And how do we equate them to our normal imagery? Well, in order to do this, this is where I might go off at a little bit of a tangent, you might think. But bear with me, because it should make sense. If I switch over to this plain white image that you can see, this is a 16-bit TIFF file in the Prophoto RGB color space. Yes, it is. And if I hover over this area here, you can see that it is RGB 100. Okay, and you'll also notice that the clipping indicator is on. And if I hover over it, you'll see that it's clipping, but it's not clipping all over, is it? No. Why is that, Andy? Well, it's dead simple. Over here, you'll see that in this big block that was lit up red, it is RGB 100, 100% 100 um, saturation of both the red, the green, and the blue channels. Now then, if I come over here, now we've got that self-same value we had in the red channel for the sun in Phil's shot, which was 99.7. And if I move down a little bit, you'll see it changes to 99.4. And if I move across to here, you'll see it goes down to 99.1. Now, 
Now you might still be wondering what the hell's going on here, Andy. Well, I'll show you because let's flip over to this image in Photoshop. And you can see I've got a levels adjustment layer. Let's go and set default. Right, so now you can see that it looks like a white rectangle. But if I grab the black slider on this levels adjustment layer and I push it up, woohoo, what's going on here? Ooh. Now then, inside the info panel, watch the values. Okay, so hovering over here in this area that clipped out red in Lightroom, you can see the values with and without the levels adjustment are 255 for all three channels. But over here, it was 254. In other words, 99.7%. Right? But it's now down to 244. This value was 253, and it's now down to 233. And this value was 252, and it's now down to 222. So what this shows you is, when you're processing your images, it shows you what you can recover as highlights. You can recover 254, in other words, 99.7%. You can recover 99.8%. You can barely recover 99.9%, .9%, but you can't recover 100%. 100% is gone. It's blown. There is nothing left to recover. So this is all about highlight detail. So, 254. Mmm... Let's now go, because I, as you, most of you will already know, I do not own a Sony camera. I wish I did, because don't for one minute think I'm anti-mirrorless, because I'm not, because all mirrorless cameras have got certain advantages over mirrored DSLRs. They certainly have, and I mean, I wished I'd got one, if only just for astrophotography. I certainly do. But if I, where am I going with this? What am I doing? Oh, yes. If I come back to um, Lightroom and we just remind ourselves, 255 is clipped. So what I want to do now is pull up, as I was saying, I don't own an A7R Mark III, uh, but a friend of mine does, and it's a patron, uh, Mike Warrender, and uh, Mike brought his 5D Mark IV and his... Um, a7R Mark III round, and we did a dynamic range test on the two cameras, yeah? So here is a very, very conservative dynamic range test. Real-world, usable dynamic range test for the A7R Mark III. And you can see that it works out at 8.8 .8 stops. Now then, here's the thing. Bear in mind, I said that was very conservative. We know that we can recover 254. So, if I go and change this EV value up here for the highlights to 4.9, putting, and you can see that instantly brings in the level 254. Now, the reason I've advised Mike to keep it sat how we had it before is that when you are metering a scene, especially with a wide-angle lens, because your spot meter in your camera is so bloody big, you can't precisely meter bright highlights. So Mike's got a spot meter. It's a one-degree spot meter, and so he can be a lot more precise in measuring his highlights. But you've always got to build yourself in a little bit of a fudge factor because you might not actually meter for the brightest highlight. You've got specular highlights and things like that. So you need to make sure that they are as, that you stand as least chance as possible of overexposing your specular highlights and blowing your specular highlights. That's the one thing you're trying to steer clear of. And so putting it up to the maximum recoverable value of the highlight on this camera now takes the dynamic range to 9.7 EV. Hmm, does. Now then, if we come back to the same camera, um, but this time it belongs to Phil, we can see that we have recorded highlights here at, whoo, uh, there you go, we've got one at 99.1. 
but you know we've got 99.7, 99.6, 99.8. We can find that in there. We know those highlights aren't blown. As it is, these shadows are not usable. But if I just go and artificially crank up the exposure, let's go and put five stops worth of exposure in. Now look at all this detail in the shadows. We can see right into these shadows here, but the penalty is noise. And noise breaks up the super fine detail. But at the end of the day, we've got data recorded in this shadow here, which just looks black otherwise. So in lab test conditions, the fact that this data has been recorded counts towards dynamic range. So we've just managed to crawl back or claw back five extra stops in the shadows. If we now go back to this dynamic range chart here, we can see we've got 9.7, but if we add those extra five, what do we come up with? 14.7, yes we do. Simple schoolboy maths. I know it's hard for some of the Sony fanboys, but well, there you go. Now then, if I come over to the internet and I go to DxO Mark and I look at the Sony A7R Mark III, 100 ISO dynamic range, holy crap, 14.7 EV, yes! I rest my case. Now then, we've all had this Sony A7R Mark IV dropped on us, which is supposedly got 15 stops of dynamic range. Well, all those guys who have been out recently and purchased an A7R Mark III won't be very happy because the launch of the A7R Mark IV is giving them 0.3 of a stop, if the 15 stops of dynamic range is to be believed, the 15 stops will be lab test. Yeah, so fundamentally, all they're getting is a third of a stop extra dynamic range. The 15 stops is lab test, but it will still show up when you do a real world test. So it will be a third of a stop higher, even in real world uh, dynamic range terms. But the launch of this, once it's out there and priced up, all it's going to do is devalue their investment. And, you know, I mean, I would not, with all the money in the world available to me, I would not want a 60 megapixel 35mm full frame camera because it's just too much. And here's why it's too much, because if I nip over to Imaging Resource, here are the specifications for the A7R Mark IV. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can see that the... There we go. Approximate pixel pitch, 3.76 microns. That is absolutely crazy. And it's simply because the knuckle-dragging know-nothing morons who go out and spend huge amounts of money upgrading their kit every two weeks they keep demanding more and more and more megapixels and it's this megapixel race which is I, I thought it was beginning to die off but obviously not you know i mean 60 megapixels i could show you now some very very stunningly detailed um raw files of the fuji gfx but i can't because they belong to somebody else and they are with me under NDAs. So I can't show them to you. But the difference between eye capacity 35mm and anything even remotely resembling medium format like the Fuji GFX, because the Fuji GFX is nowhere near the surface area. It was something like a uh, Phase 1 IQ 260. Nowhere near the bloody price either. But things are what they are. I just wouldn't... I mean, 3.76 microns. God, you'd be lucky if this camera's diffraction limited to F8, F10 maybe. Um, the fact that it's a backside illuminated sensor does actually put... Um, does actually give you a bit more resistance to diffraction. 
Um, so yeah, maybe you can get away with F10, maybe you can get away with F11, but I don't know till I see some files out of it, and I can't see Sony um, lending me one. But anyway, there we go. That's not what we're here to discuss. Um, all I'm wanting to get you to understand is the fundamental difference between real-world usable dynamic range without a safety margin now and um, the actual lab-tested dynamic range, which, uh, you know. But as a lab test, it's valid because the sensor has recorded the detail. And it was the same, it's the same argument I have with the Nikon D5. If you're into surveillance work and you can extract this detail, running the exposure slider up and getting all the detail out and maybe running the shadow recovery slider up as well, it can mean the difference between an identification of a suspect, yes, or not, and therefore a conviction or lack thereof. So, you know, but as for producing... Um, anything that you might regard as a normal everyday photograph, uh, be it a wildlife photograph or a landscape photograph or fine art imagery, this sort of data is useless because it's full of noise and lacking super fine detail. But, as I say, that is testing lab dynamic range. So just... You know, if you're thinking about buying a, a Sony A7R Mark IV, don't let me stop you. But you might not be getting quite what you think. But um, anyway, there we go. Um, all I'm doing here is just trying to give you some idea of the difference between real-world dynamic range and lab-testing dynamic range. And please note that neither Nikon nor Canon ever quote dynamic ranges for any of their cameras. Hmm... Camera manufacturers tend not to. Consumer electronics companies? Hmm, yeah, maybe another matter. Anyway, there you go. I hope that's been giving you some food for thought, giving you a bit of useful information. And uh, yeah, there you go. I shall see you again soon in the next one, which might not be quite so controversial. Yes, hmm, true.